a good girl. In November 1940, when Max Vandenberg arrived in the kitchen of 33 Himmel Street, he was 24 years old. His clothes seemed to weigh him down, and his tiredness was such that an itch could break him in two. He stood shake, shaking and shaken in the doorway. Do you still play the t accordion? Of course. The question was really, will you still help me? Liesel's papa walked to the front door and opened it. Cautiously, he looked outside each way and returned. The verdict was nothing. Max Vandenberg, the Jew, closed his eyes and drooped a little further into safety. The very idea of it was ludicrous, but it, he accepted it nonetheless. Hans checked that the curtains were properly closed. Not a crack could be showing. As he did so, Max could no longer bear it. He crouched down and clasped his hands. The darkness stroked him. His fingers smelled of suitcase, metal, mind comp, and survival. It was only when he lifted his head that the dim light from the hallway reached his eyes. He noticed a pajama girl standing there in full view. Papa? Max stood up like a struck match. The darkness swelled now around him. Everything's fine, Liesel, Papa said. Papa said, go back to bed. She lingered a moment before her feet dragged from behind. When she stopped and stole one last look at the foreigner in the kitchen, she could decipher the outline of a book on the table. Don't be afraid, she heard Papa whisper. She's a good girl. For the next hour, the good girl lay wide awake in bed, listening to the quiet fumbling of sentences in the kitchen. One wild card was yet to be played. A short history of the Jewish fistfighter. Max Vandenberg was born in 1916. He grew up in Stuttgart. When he was younger, he grew to love nothing more than a good fistfight. He had his first bout when he was 11 years old and skinny as, as a whittled broom handle. Wenzel Gruber, that's who he fought. He had a smart mouth at Gruber Kid and wire curly hair. The local playground demanded that they fight and neither boy was about to argue. They fought like champions for a minute. Just when it was getting interesting, both boys were hauled away by their collars, a watchful parent. A trickle of blood was dripping from Max's mouth. He tasted it, and it tasted good. Not many people who came from his neighborhood were fighters, and if they were, they didn't do it with their fists. In those days, they said the Jews preferred to simply stand and take things, take the abuse quietly, and then work their way back to the top. Obviously, every Jew is not the same. He was nearly two years old when his father died, shot to pieces on a grassy hill. <clears throat> when he was nine, his mother was completely broke. She sold the mu music studio that doubled as their apartment, and they moved to his uncle's house. There he grew up with six cousins who, who battered, annoyed, and loved him. Fighting with the oldest one, Isaac, was the training ground for his fist fighting. He was trounced almost every night. At 13, tragedy struck again when his uncle died. As percentages would suggest, his uncle was not a hothead like Max. He was the type of person who worked quietly away for every little reward. He kept to himself and sacrificed everything for his family, and he died of something growing in his stomach, something akin to a poison bowling ball. As, a, as is often the case, the family surrounded the bed and watched him capitulate. Somehow, between the sadness and loss, Max Vandenberg, who was now a teenager with hard hands, blackened eyes, and a sore tooth, was also, was also a little disappointed, even disgruntled. As he watched his uncle sink slowly into the bed, he decided that he would never allow himself to die like that. The man's face was so accepting, so yellow and tranquil, despite the violent architecture of his skull, the endless jawline stretching for miles. Sorry, my dog just turned on my Roomba. <clears throat> the pop-up cheekbones and the potholes, so calm it made the boy want to ask something. Where's the fight, he wondered. Where's the will to hold on? Of course, at 13, he was a little excessive in his harshness. He had not looked something like me in the face. Not yet. With the rest of them, he stood around the bed and watched the man die, a safe merge from life to death. The light in the window was gray and orange, the color of summer's skin, and his uncle appeared relieved when his breathing disappeared completely. When death captures me, the boy vowed, he will feel my fist on his face. Personally, I quite like that. Such stupid gallantry. Yes, I like that a lot. From that moment on, he started to fight with greater regularity. A group of die-hard friends and enemies would, get, would gather down at a small reserve on Stever Street, and they would fight in the dying light. Archetypal Germans, the odd Jew, the boy from the East. It didn't matter. There was nothing like a good fight to expel the teenaged energy. Even the enemies were an inch away from friendship. He enjoyed the tight circles and the unknown, the bittersweetness of uncertainty, to win or to lose. It was a feeling in the stomach that would be stirred around until he thought he could no longer tolerate it. The only remedy was to move forward and throw punches. 
Max was not the type of boy to die thinking about it. His favorite fight now that he looked back was fight number five against a tall, tough, rangy kid named Walter Kugler. They were 15. Walter had won all four of their previous encounters, but this time Max could feel something different. There was new blood in him, the blood of victory, and it had the capability to both frighten and excite. As always, there was a tight circle crowded around them. There was grubby ground. There were smiles practically wrapped around the onlooking faces. Money was clutched in filthy fingers, and the calls and cries were filled with such vitality that there was nothing else but this. God, there was so, such joy and fear there, such brilliant commotion. The two fighters were clenched with the intensity of the moment, their faces loaded up with expression, exaggerated with the stress of it, the wide-eyed concentration. After a minute or so of testing each other out, they began moving closer and taking more risks. It was a street fight, after all, not an hour-long title fight. They didn't have all day. Come on, Max, one of his friends was calling out. There was no breath between any of the words. Come on, Maxie Taxi, you've got him now, you've got him. Jewel Boy, you've got him, you've got him. A small kid with soft tufts of hair, a beaten nose, and, a, and swampy eyes. Max was a good head shorter than his opposition. His fighting style was utterly graceless, all bent over and nudging forward, throwing fast punches at the face of Kugler. The other boy, clearly stronger and more skillful, remained upright, throwing jabs that constantly landed on Max's cheeks and chin. Max kept coming. Even with the heavy absor absorption of punches and punishment, he continued moving forward. Blood discolored his lips. It would soon be dried across his teeth. There was a great roar when he was knocked down. Money was almost exchanged. Max stood up. He was beaten down one more time before he changed tactics, luring Walter Kugler a little closer than he'd well wanted to come. Once he was there, Max was able to apply a short, sharp jab to his face. It stuck. Exactly on the nose. Kugler, suddenly blinded, shuffled back, and Max seized his, his chance. He followed him over to the right and jabbed him once more and opened him and opened him up with a punch that reached into his ribs. The right hand that, that ended him landed on his chin. Walter Kugler was on, was on the ground, his blonde hair peppered with dirt. His legs were parted in a V. Tears like crystal floated down his skin, despite the fact that he was not crying. The tears had been bashed out of him. The circle countered, <clears throat> counted. They always counted, just in case. Voices and numbers. The custom after a fight was that the loser would raise the hand of the victor. When Kugler finally stood up, he walked su sullenly to Max Vandenberg and lifted his arm into the air. Thanks, Max told him. Kugler proffered a, a warning. Next time, I'll I kill you. Altogether, over the next few years, Max Vandenberg and Walter Kugler fought 13 times. Walter was always seeking revenge for that first victory Max took from him, and Max was looking to emulate his moment of glory. In the end, the record stood at 10-3 for Walter. They fought each other until 1933 when they were 17. Grudging respect turned to genuine friendship and the urge to fight left, left them. Both held jobs until Max was sacked with the rest of the Jews at the Jeterman Engineering Factory in 35. That wasn't long after the Nuremberg laws came in forbidding Jews to have German citizenship and for Germans and Jews to intermarry. Jesus, Walter said one evening when they met on the small corner where they used to fight. That was a time, wasn't it? There was none of this craziness around. We could never fight like that now. Max disagreed. Yes, we could. You can't marry a Jew, but there's no law against fighting one. Walter smiled. There's probably a law rewarding it as long as you win. As long as, as you win. <clears throat> For the next few years, they saw each other sporadically at best. Max, with the rest of the Jews, was steadily rejected and repeatedly trodden upon, while Walter disappeared inside his job, a printing firm. If you're the type who's interested, yes, there were a few girls in those years, one named Tanya, the other Hildy. Neither of them lasted. There was no time, most likely due to the uncertainty and mounting pressure. Max needed to scavenge for work. What could he offer those girls? By 1938, it was difficult to imagine that life could get any harder. Then came November 9th, crystal knocked, the night of broken glass. It was the very incident that destroyed so many of his fellow Jews, but it proved to be Max Vandenberg's moment of escape. He was 22. Many Jewish est est establishments were being surgically smashed and looted when there was a clatter of knuckles on the apartment door. With his aunt, his mother, his cousins, and their children, Max was crammed into the living room. Off Machin, the family watched each other. There was a great temptation to scatter into the other rooms, but apprehension is the strangest thing. They couldn't move. Again, open up! Isaac stood and walked to the door. The wood was alive, still humming from the beating it had just been given. He looked back at the faces, naked with fear, turned the lock, and opened the door. As expected, it was a Nazi, in uniform. 
Never. That was Max's first response. He clung to his mother's hand and that of Sarah, the nearest of his cousins. I won't leave. If we all can't go, I don't go either. He was lying. When he was pushed out by the rest of his family, the relief struggled inside him like an obscenity. It was something he didn't want to feel, but nonetheless, he felt it with such gusto, it made him want to throw up. How could he? How could he? But he did. Bring nothing, Walter told him. Just what you're wearing. I'll give you the rest. Max, it was his mother. From a drawer, she took an old piece of paper and stuffed it in his jacket pocket. If ever, she held him one last time by the elbows, this could be your last hope. He looked into her aging face and kissed her very hard on the lips. Come on, Walter pulled at him as the rest of the family said their goodbyes and gave him money and a, and a few valuables. It's chaos out there, and chaos is what we need. They left without looking back. It tortured him. If only he'd turned for one last look at his family as he left the apartment. Perhaps then the guilt would not have been so heavy. No final goodbye. No final grip of the eyes. Nothing but goneness. For the next two years, he remained in an empty storeroom. It was in a building where Walter had worked in, a pre in previous years. There was very little food. There was plenty of suspicion. The remaining Jews with money in the neighborhood were emigrating. The Jews without money were also trying, but without much success. Max's family fell into the latter category. Walter checked on them occasionally, as inconspicuously as he could. One afternoon when he visited, someone else opened the door. When Max heard the news, his body felt like it was being screwed up into a ball, like a page littered with mistakes, like garbage. Yet each day he managed to unravel and straighten himself, disgusted and thankful, wrecked, but somehow not, not torn into pieces. Halfway through 1939, just over six months into the period of hiding, they decided that a new course of action needed to be taken. They examined the piece of paper Max was handed upon his desertion. That's right, his desertion, not only his escape. That was how he viewed it, amid the grotesquery of his, of his relief. We already know what was written on that piece of paper. One name, one address. Hans Huberman, Himmel Street 33, Mulching. It's getting worse, Walter told Max. Any time now they could find us out. There was much hunching in the dark. We don't know what might happen. I might get caught. You might need to find that place. I'm too scared to ask anyone for help here. They might put me in. There was only one solution. I'll go down there and find this man. If he's turned into a Nazi, which is very likely, I'll just turn around. At least we know then, Richtig. Max gave him every last Fennig to make the trip. And a few days later, when Walter returned, they embraced before he held his breath. And Walter nodded. He's good. He still plays that accordion your mother told you about, your father's. He's not a member of the party. He gave me money. At this stage, Hans Huberman was only a list. He's fairly poor. He's married and there's a kid. This sparked Max's attention even further. How old? Ten. You can't have everything. Yes, kids have big mouths. We're lucky as it is. They sat in silence a while. It was Max who disturbed it. He must already hate me, huh? I don't think so. He gave me the money, didn't he? He said he, he said a promise is a promise. A week later, a letter came. Hans notified Walter Kugler that he would try to send things to help whenever he could. There was a one-page map of mulching in Greater Munich, as well as a direct route from Pacing, the more reliable train station, to his front door. In his letter, the last words were obvious. Be careful. Midway through May 1940, Mein Kampf arrived and a key taped to the inside cover. The man's a genius, Max decided, but there was still a shudder when he thought about traveling to Munich. Clearly, he wished, along with the other parties involved, that the journey would not have to be made at all. You don't always get what you wish for, especially in Nazi Germany. Again, time passed. The war expanded. Max remained hidden from the world in another empty room until the inevitable. Walter was notified that he was being sent to Poland to continue the assertion of Germany's authority over both the Poles and Jews alike. One was not much better than the other. The time had come. Max made his way to Munich and Mulching, and now he sat in a stranger's kitchen asking for the help he craved and suffering the condemnation he felt he deserved. Hans Huberman shook his hand and introduced himself. He made him some coffee in the dark. The girl had been qu gone quite a while, but now some more footsteps had appro approached her rival, the wild card. In the darkness, all three of them were completely isolated. They all stared. Only the woman spoke. The wrath of Rosa. Liesel had drifted back to sleep when the unmistakable voice of Rosa Huberman entered the kitchen. It shocked her awake. Was this loss? Curiosity got the better of her then, as she imagined a tirade thrown down from the wrath of Rosa. There was definite movement in the shuffle of a chair. After 10 minutes of excruciating discipline, Liesel made her way to the corridor, and what she saw truly amazed her, because Rosa Huberman was at Max Vandenberg's shoulder, watching him gulp, her, gulp down her infamous pea soup. Candlelight was standing at the table. It did not waver. Mama was grave. 
Her plump figure glowed with, with worry. Somehow, though, there was also a look of triumph on her face, and it was not the triumph of having saved another human being from persecution. It was something more along the lines of, see, at least he's not complaining. She looked from the soup to the Jew to the soup. When she spoke again, she asked only if he wanted more. Max declined, preferring instead to rush to the sink and vomit. His back convulsed and his arms were, were well spread. His fingers gripped the metal. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Rosa muttered. Another one. Turning around, Max apologized. His words were slippery and small, quelled by the acid. I'm sorry. I think I ate too much. My stomach, you know, it's been so long since. I don't think it can handle such. Move, Rosa ordered him. She started cleaning up. When she was finished, she found the young man at the kitchen table utterly morose. Hans was sitting opposite, his hands cupped over the sheet of wood. Liesel from the hallway could see the drawn face of the stranger, and behind it, the worried expression scribbled like a mess onto Mama. She looked at both her foster parents. Who were these people? Liesel's lecture. Exactly what kind of people Hans and Rosa Huberman were was not the easiest problem to solve. Kind people, ridiculously ignorant people, people of questionable sanity. What was easier to define was their predicament. The situation of Hans and Rosa Huberman, very sticky indeed, in fact, frightfully sticky. When a Jew shows up at your place of residence in the early hours of, of morning, in the very birthplace of Nazism, you're, very, you're likely to experience extreme levels of discomfort, anxiety, disbelief, paranoia. Each plays its part, and each leads to a sneaking suspicion that a less than he heavenly consequence awaits. The fear is shiny, ruthless in the eyes. The surprising point to make is that despite the iridescent fear glowing at as it did in the dark, they somehow resisted the urge for hysteria. hysteria. Mama ordered Liesel away. Bet so much, the voice calm but firm, highly unusual. Papa came in a few minutes later and lifted the covers on the vacant bed. Alice good, Liesel, everything good? Yes, Papa. As you can see, we have a visitor. She could only just make out the shape of Hans Huberman's tallness in the dark. He'll sleep in here tonight. Yes, Papa. A few minutes later, Max Vandenberg was in the room, noiseless and opaque. The man did not breathe. He did not move. Yet somehow he traveled from the doorway to the bed and was under the covers. Everything good? It was Papa again, talking this time to Max. The reply floated from his mouth, then molded itself like a stain to the ceiling. Such was his feeling of shame. Yes, thank you. He said it again when Papa made his way over to his customary position in the chair next to Liesel's bed. Thank you. Another hour passed before Liesel fell asleep. She slept hard and long. A hand woke her just after 8.30 the next morning. The voice at the end of it informed her that she would not be attending school that day. Apparently, she was sick. When she awoke completely, she watched the stranger in the bed opposite. The blanket showed only a nest of lopsided hair at the top, and there was not a sound as if he'd somehow trained himself even to sleep more quietly. With great care, she walked the length of him, following Papa to the hall. For the first time ever, the kitchen and Mama were dormant. It was a kind of amused inaugural silence. To Liesel's relief, it lasted only a few minutes. There was food and the sound of eating. Mama announced the day's priority. She sat at the table and, sa and said, Now listen, Liesel, Papa's going to tell you something today. This was serious. She didn't even say Samanj. It was a personal feat of abstinence. He'll talk to you and you have to listen. Is that clear? The girl was still swallowing. Is that clear, Samanj? That was better. The girl nodded. When she re-entered the bedroom to fetch her clothes, the body in the opposite bed had turned and curled up. It was no longer a straight log, but a kind of Z shape, reaching diagonally from corner to corner, zigzagging the bed. She could see his face now in the tired light. His mouth was open, and his skin was the color of eggshells. Whiskers coated his jaw and chin, and his ears were hard and flat. He had a small but misshapen nose. Liesel, she turned. Move it! She moved to the washroom. Once changed and in the, in the hallway, she realized she would not be traveling far. Papa was standing in front of the door in the basement. He smiled very faintly, lit the lamp, and led her down. Among the mounds of drop sheets and the smell of paint, Papa told her to make herself comfortable. Ignited on the walls were the painted words, learned in the past. I need to tell you some things. Liesel sat on top of a meter-tall heap of drop sheets, Papa on a 15-liter paint can. For a few minutes, he searched for the words. When they came, he stood to deliver them. He rubbed his eyes. Liesel, he said quietly, I was never sure if any of this would happen, so I never told you. About me. About the man upstairs. He walked from one end of the basement to the other, the lamp light magnifying his shadow. It turned him into a giant on the wall, walking back and forth. When he stopped pacing, his shadow loomed behind him, watching. Someone was always watching. You know my accordion? He said, and there the story began. He explained World War I and Eric Vandenberg and the visit to the fallen soldier's wife. The boy who came into the room that day is the man upstairs. Versette? Understand? 
The book thief sat and listened to Hans Huberman's story. It lasted a good hour until the moment of truth, which involved a very obvious and necessary lecture. Liesel, you must listen. Papa made her stand up and held her hand. They faced the wall, dark shapes in the practice of words. Firmly, he held her fingers. Remember the foreigner's birthday when we walked home from the fire that night? Remember what you promised me? The girl concurred. To the wall, she said, that I would keep a secret. That's right. Between the hand-holding shadows, the painted words were scattered about, perched on their shoulders, resting on their heads, and hanging from their arms. Liesel, if you tell anyone about the man up there, we will all be in big trouble. He walked the fine line of scaring her into oblivion and soothing her enough to keep her calm. He fed her the sentences and watched with his metallic eyes. Desperation and placidity. As At the very least, Mama and I will be taken away. Hans was clearly worried that he was on the verge of frightening her too much, but he calculated the risk, preferring to err on the side of too much fear rather than not enough. The girl's compliance had to be an absolute immutable fact. Toward the end, Hans Humerman looked at Liesel Memminger and made certain she was focused. He gave her a list of consequences. If you tell anyone about that man, her teacher, Rudy, it didn't matter whom, what mattered was that all were punishable. For starters, he said, I will take each and every one of your books and I will burn them. It was callous. I'll throw them in the stove or the fireplace. He was certainly acting like a tyrant, but it was necessary. Understand? The shock made a hole in her heart, in her very neat, very precise. Tears welled. Yes, Papa. Next. He had to remain hard and he needed to strain for, her, for it. They'll take you away from me. Do you want that? She was crying now in earnest. Nine. Good. His grip on her hand tightened. They'll drag that man up there away, and maybe Mama and me too, and we will never, ever come back. And that did it. The girl began to sob so uncontrollably that Papa was dying to pull her into him and hug her tight. He didn't. Instead, he squatted down and watched her directly in the eyes. He unleashed his quietest word so far. Bertesh Dumich, do you understand me? The girl nodded. She cried, and now defeated, broken, her Papa held her in the, in the painted air in the kerosene light. I understand, Papa, I do. Her voice was muffled against his body, and they stayed like that for a few minutes. Liesel was squashed breath and Papa rubbing her back. Upstairs, when they returned, they found Mama sitting in the kitchen, alone and pensive. When she saw them, she stood and be beckoned Liesel to come over, noticing the dried-up tears that streaked her. She brought the girl into her and heaped a, a typically rugged embrace around her body. Alles gut, Samensch? She didn't need an answer. Everything was good, but it was awful, too.